and mine is loud, so <laughs> I told him this morning to turn it down, and he still not turned it down. <laughs> well, welcome, everyone. It's glad to see you all here today, full house. That's wonderful. And welcome to all you watching live on Facebook. We're excited to have you all here. After church today, we do have a little fellowship. We've got snacks, finger foods, which I've heard that there's some things you're going to need a fork for, so not quite finger foods, but we're just going to have a little get-together. And Elaine wanted me to mention that she is going to have a drawing after the dinner. It's a secret is all I know. I know not what it is or what it's about, but something is going to be drawn after dinner. And she has a whole buggy of milk in the garage, and she said, please, everybody take some milk when you go today. So the milk is free. Um, well, let's stand and let's sing a couple songs of praise and worship this morning as we get started on this fourth Sunday of Advent. We'll sing a couple songs, and then we will have the offering. It's the same that appeared and the wise men revered When hope was born this night Out upon the snowy fields There's a silent peace that heals And it echoes the grace of our Savior's embrace Because hope was born this night Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Let all of the world sing the chorus of joy, because hope was born this night. Christmas bells ring as softly as church choir sings. I apologize for our sound man. He's new today. When hope was born this night There's angels in this place And my heart resounds with the praise Like a shepherd so scared I'll rejoice and declare That hope was born this night Glory to God in the highest Peace on earth Goodwill toward men, let all of the world sing the chorus of joy because hope was born this night. Gloria, Gloria, Gloria. toward men let all of the world sing the chorus of joy because hope was born this night glory to god in the highest peace on earth goodwill toward men let all of the world sing the chorus of joy because hope was born this night hope was born this night because Christ was born this night. One 
of my favorite songs. Now if we can get our sound man to scoot that over a little bit. Yep, there you go. <laughs> so it wouldn't block part of our words. <laughs> we'll forgive him. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me, and all my days I've been held in your hands, from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will see of the goodness God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire, and in darkest night, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, and I will see of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will see of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you This is running after, it's running after.
the goodness of God. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to take up the offering at this time. Um, and I know Freddie and Robin want to help me take up the offering today. I see it in their eyes, so. <laughs> <laughs> They're the first ones that looked at me. <laughs> so if you two will come. Uh, what a privilege it is to give back what God has given to us. You know, he tells us what we do for the least of these, my brothers, you have done for me. And I know one of mine and Michael's favorite songs is the story about Conrad, who uh, Jesus promised him he was going to visit him that night. And he sent a lady that was cold. He sent a man that had no shoes. He sent a, a lost child, a, a little boy that couldn't find his way home. And at the end of the night, he's like, God, you promised me you, were, you would visit me, and yet you haven't come. And he said, oh, but I did come. I came in the beggar. I came with a woman who was cold, carrying the wood on her back. The little boy that was lost and the man who was hungry and he said and you welcomed me in every time during this holiday season that is what we want to have is the attitude of giving like jesus gave to us jesus loves each of you so much his goodness is so good every morning and every night and that is the love and the hope that we need to share with this world there's not enough joy in the world, and we need to make the joy of the Lord known once again. So thank you for everything you've given. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you for your many blessings. I pray your blessing on each one here, Lord, those that gave and those that couldn't give. And I pray, Lord, that those that couldn't give, that you would meet their need as well, God. So just take this offering and expand it to reach all the four corners of the world that you want it to reach to touch every heart, change every mind. And we thank you, and we ask all this in the precious name of Jesus, and amen. Amen. Well, Stan, let's sing a couple more songs. This is our Christmas season, and we want to sing all about Jesus and how he came for us. <laughs> this has always been one of my favorite songs. I'm glad Jessica picked it out.
you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you deliver will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy could calm a storm with his hand? Did you your baby boy has walked where angels trod, and when you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God. Oh, Mary, did you know? We're just so very, very thankful, Lord, that you came to this earth, fully God and fully man, to save us. And just like Mary, we didn't know. We didn't know. We don't know now, but we have chosen, Father, to follow you every step of the way. And I just pray, God, that today, as, J as Jay comes and brings us your message, your message of love, the love that you have for all of us, Lord, that you would just bless him in such a way, Lord. And I pray, God, that each of us will receive that message and that we would be changed and transformed by your words, the words that we hear. So I pray a special blessing today, Lord. We're very thankful to have Jay back. He is a wonderful part of our family. I don't want to put any pressure on him, but we're just very, very blessed to have him and so many other wonderful people to come and minister us. And I know, God, that all good gifts from you come from you, and Jay is one of those good gifts. So I just pray your blessing. We thank you. We love you, God. And we give you this service as our offering and token of our love and appreciation and adoration for everything you have done for us. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. And amen. You may be seated, and I'm going to read the Advent Scripture reading today um, before Jay comes up. If I can find it. Da, 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 da. And Mary. Well, the first Sunday of Advent, Rick Heisel spoke to us on hope, 
the hope that we have in Jesus and the plan that he has for our lives and that we can trust in his plan and his purpose for our lives. And that is the hope that we have. And then Pastor Debbie spoke on peace. She spoke on how hope has come. Uh, hope was born, but peace is here and peace is within us. And that is Jesus Christ. And then Pastor Mike spoke on the joy of the Lord that we have because of what he has done for us, that we can have salvation, we can have eternal life with him, and what joy that is. So we have litten, litten the candles every week, and I don't know what order they're in. Hope is over here. Hope was the first Sunday. Please forgive me, I should have lit those as I was talking about them. And then Debbie spoke on peace. So we light the candle of peace for the peace of Jesus Christ that lives in us and we light the candle of joy the joy of the Lord that we have because of his gift that he gave to us and today we're gonna light the candle of love and the scripture reading for this week's passage comes from Matthew 1 18 verse 23 and it starts, it says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to the public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name of Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Hello? Y'all hear me? Okay. Technology always makes me nervous. I want to say uh, th thank you all for showing up and for those who are watching online through the power of the internet. Where have I been, right? <laughs> this is, it's been three years since I've given a message. Yeah, I mean, I've done some things at UPike, but three years. And I'll be honest with you, it was, it's been a tough three years for me. Um, I didn't handle the pandemic like I thought I was going to handle it. I turned 40 during the pandemic, so you can imagine. <laughs> it's a tough time. You know, ever since I, you know, when I graduated high school, I just kind of buckled down and I would work and go to school full time. And I just worked and all the way up for like 20 years working and, and trying to make it happen and trying to go the next step in my career and all that. And then when the pandemic hit, it's kind of like, hits the brakes on my life. I got a chance to really sit and, and think about my life, the things that have accumulated over my life, the troubles I've had, and it really brought me down. I felt empty. You ever felt empty in your life? And when you do ministry and you feel empty, you have two choices. You can go and you can play church, get up here and try to fill people up when you yourself are empty. Or you can withdraw for a little while and try to get your act together. But during this whole time, even when I felt like maybe God wasn't with me, he was there. He's always there. Even when you look over your whole life, you see when God was there. You just don't see it in the moment. But when you look back, you see that God is there. It is, it is him that gives us our assurance, not ourselves. I'm not really a a preacher, you know. I'm not a, 
Yeah, I'm not a pastor. Y'all don't want me to be a pastor because I, I would spring foot washings on y'all randomly, you know what I mean? <laughs> so you don't want that. <laughs> but, you know, I'm just a man who, who Jesus Christ reached out into my heart, changed my life, and I just want to share that with you all. That's who I am. So I appreciate that. I appreciate your prayers. Um, today I'm going to be talking about love, of course. I like to start out services with a prayer, though, if you don't mind, if we pray real quick. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you do for us each and every day. We thank you for the breath you give us. Lord, help us to pay attention to your word, to apply it to our lives. God, please help us to open our minds to your teaching, not live our life the way that we want, but the way that you have commanded us to live to show each other love in the way that Christ showed us love. We thank you so much for your patience and love in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want to talk about how we should love one another and how God loves us. This Advent season we're talking about love, of course. So, You know, love is one of the most difficult things to define. It's a hard thing to define, isn't it? Everybody sees love in different ways, yet it's a central theme in Jesus' ministry. I can define hate easily. It's pretty easy to understand what hate is, right? We all kind of agree on what hate is for the most part. But love is so complex. It's hard to, to really define. And I can go get all academic with you and tell you that in the Hebrew and the Greek, which is what the Bible is written in, that there's several different words for love. There's hesed, which is a Hebrew word that means to com a completely undeserved love, a faithful, enduring love. I'm probably mispronouncing this, but the word aheb means to delight in, to desire, to be attached to. The Greek word agape, you've probably heard that before. It's a patient, sacrificial love. There's all these words for love in this language. But in English, what do we have? We have love. We might have some other slang words, but we all have different opinions on what love is. We don't see love in the same way. And many of us have learned what we believe love is from the circumstances in our life, the things that we've been raised to believe about love, the experiences we've had. Some of us have a warped sense of love an unhealthy sense of love. Some of us haven't experienced love much at all in our lives. So it's, it's really difficult. It's a, it's a hard word to really talk about. So the question is, how does the Bible, how does the Word of God define love? And our first scripture, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, and I don't know if you can pull that up. This is usually said at uh, weddings. It's on past that part. That's starting in verse 4. I'll go ahead and read it. This is what you hear at weddings sometimes. This really applies across the board. It's not just for married folks. It's for everybody. This is how uh, Paul teaches us about love. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Think about that. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Anybody in here like to engage in a grudge matches with people and feud with folks? That's not love. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It's, it always protects. It always trusts. Always hopes. Always perseveres. That's how the Bible describes love. In verse 13, which I don't think we have up there, but it says of the three paramount things, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. It's the greatest thing. You know, some people see love as an emotion. They might get, you know, some butterflies for their sweetheart, and that's love, you know. Some people see loyalty and dedication as love. Some people see the giving and receiving of gifts as love. But biblical love is defined mostly by our intentions and our behaviors. That is what you see most of the time when you see love mentioned in the Bible. It talks about our intentions and our behaviors. The things that we say, you know, can be, can be false. It can be, uh, you know, just words. You know, a lot of words can be said to make you feel loved, right? 
and that can be important. If you never tell people in your life you love them, then that, they may wonder, does, does my daddy or my mommy or my grandma or my papa love me? <laughs> I mean, it's good to tell people you love them, but it's mainly found in our behavior, the way we treat one another. Are we patient? Are we kind to one another? People can find themselves in abusive relationships, and you've seen it before. Someone might hurt somebody, and then when they come down off of whatever they're on or whatever, they say, honey, you know, I didn't mean to do that. You know, I didn't mean, I won't do that ever again. You, baby, you know I love you. you. You've seen that before. But their actions are not showing that. And if you're watching a TV show and that's happening, you're screaming at the TV, honey, leave him, he's not good for you. But when you're in that situation, you'll buy into any kind of words, especially if you're love-starved. You'll buy into that. But it's, not, it's shown in your behavior. Some people think passion is love. It's not necessarily the same thing. Stalkers have passion. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know if that's love or what that is. <laughs> We've got to really understand what love is as Christians. Especially godly love. Love is shown, it's not only said. Our love for God is shown in our behavior. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And when Jesus was being challenged by the Pharisees, the religious people of the time, he rebuked them and he quoted Isaiah and he said, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So they, they'll, some people will praise God, but their hearts are far from him. Love is shown in our behaviors. And sometimes love corrects. That's something the world don't understand. You ever have to correct your child who's doing wrong? That's love. Spanking sometimes is love. That's some rough love, but it's love. <laughs> love don't always go along with the crowd either. It rebukes. Love rejoices with the truth, and sometimes people don't want to hear the truth. That's what our scripture says. Love rejoices with truth. Some people don't want to hear the truth. And when you tell them the truth, they think you don't love them, but really you're the one in the whole situation that does love them, enough to tell them the truth. That's what real love is. That's what biblical love is. It's something that we have to learn. We're not born knowing what love is, like biblical love. We don't know God's love by default. We have to learn it. We have to read about it. We have to study it. Study Jesus' teachings. It's a love that denies herself of our own passions. It's a love that prioritizes others over ourselves. It's a love that thinks to check on your neighbor or the person that's in the nursing home or the person that might need help that it just maybe they're too proud to ask. It's a love that checks on people. That's the kind of love that God is teaching us to have. If someone needs you to go a mile with them, it's a love that goes two miles with them. It's a love that goes the extra mile. That's what the love of Christ is like. It's a love that turns the other cheek, and that's one I struggle with. <laughs> you know? It, it's, you know, you want to get people back sometimes whenever they hurt you. But it's a love that has grace for those who are not even sorry what, what they did to you. Christian love is extraordinary. It's the kind of love that if you show it, people are like, what is up with them people? You know, what do they have that I don't? That's the kind of love we should have. It's a love that gets attention because it, it's extraordinary. It's not love that you see every day. That's the kind of love that we need to have. That when they see the things that we do, they praise our God in heaven. That's the kind of love we need to have. And our prayer should be, God, help us to learn to love like Christ loves. Why is it so difficult for us to love like Christ? Is it not one of the most difficult things? It is in my life. Maybe it ain't for you. I don't know. It's the most difficult thing sometimes. Yet it's the most important thing. You know, some of us, our love has grown cold. You know, that life can wrench the love right out of your heart. People hating each other over political differences. During the pandemic, I was needing a word from God, and I'd hear the pastor talk about, did you get the stab? Did they, did they get you with the jab? And, you know, did you vote for this guy or that guy? They didn't do that here, but... They did a, every church service I go to, there's always some sort of political thing. And I'm like, I want to hear about Jesus for just a little, little bit. I, I need something right now. You know, the world's kind of coming to an end here, and I need some, I need some hope. 
you know, people have lost their patience for one another. I went to a restaurant the other day, and this woman was just giving this waiter, what for? This is not the right food. I've been waiting here for 20 minutes, and blah, 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 blah. And that person's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And she's just letting them have it. And I'm like, my goodness, where is our patience? You know, have we lost our way as a country, as a people? Have we forgotten that of faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love? Have we forgotten that? I hope not. There's two things I want to talk about. I want to talk about how we should love, and I want to talk about the love of God. And Jesus is the ultimate expression of God's love toward us. And this Christmas season, we focus on the birth of Jesus Christ, his, God's expression of love. And our scripture, our other scripture, which we've already read, but I want to read again, is Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. If we can get that up there. Otherwise, I'm going to get my paper Bible, which is over there. <laughs> We're going to start in verse 18. Great. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And this took place to fulfill what the Lord said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Joseph woke up, and he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. And he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So that's our scripture. That's when, that's when God's love entered the world as Jesus Christ. And what's interesting about this scripture is that the parts before it talks about the lineage of Christ, the the ancestry of Christ through King David. And it's important that they say that because the, the prophecy is that the Messiah must be a descendant of King David. So it goes through this whole lineage, you know, the begats. I, I was going to save you the, the begats today. It's a pretty long list of people. Well, what really struck me is after giving you all the begats on how Jesus is related to King David, it says, by the way, Joseph, Jesus ain't your baby. <laughs> and I've, I've heard this probably preached a thousand times before in my life, but I never realized that Jesus Christ was adopted. That never occurred to you? It never occurred, never occurred to me. I never noticed it. My brother, see, my family is growing. It's exploding right now. My brother is adopting a girl in, in January. He has a boy and a girl, and he's adopting the girl. And she's a firecracker. She's adorable, but man, she, whew. You know, they say that when, whatever you do to your parents, that when you grow up, that it'll be done to you by some kid. It doesn't skip uncles either, apparently. She's, <laughs> she knows how to really, you know. But she's also a lot of fun. She's just a sweet little girl, but she knows how to really to wrench your nerves sometimes. But I was thinking, you know, Jesus Christ was adopted. Joseph agreed to take Jesus into his family. And we have this innate desire to connect with our blood relatives, to our, our biological mom and dad. But, you know, there is a special kind of love that comes with adoption. And it's, you know, special if you're adopting with a pure intentions and a pure heart. It's a unique kind of love. It's a love that says, I choose you to be in my family. And Jesus was adopted. And see, there was a scandal, you know. And that's the interesting thing about the scripture, too, is that there's a scandal with Jesus coming into the world. It was God's law that said if someone would be found guilty of adultery, that they would be put to death. 
And I read at this time they would have not put them to death, but maybe publicly humiliate them in this particular town. So we have here the law kind of at odds with Jesus coming into the world and is all orchestrated by God. And the Bible says that Joseph, being a righteous man, showed grace to Mary before he knew that this was something that God was doing. So there was a scandal. And Joseph was found to be a righteous man in that situation. When the angels told Joseph what was going on, Joseph adopted Jesus, and Jesus was grafted into Joseph's family. Just like we are grafted into the family of God through the blood of Jesus Christ, because he first loved us. So you see, Jesus will often experience things like we experience, even being adopted, because we need to be adopted into his family. And no greater love has a man than to lay down his life for his friends. And that's what Jesus did for us. And we say that blood is thicker than water. But there's a special kind of love that comes with being grafted into the family of God. That God is saying, I choose you. That's what he's saying. That's the love of God toward us. How will people know that we're a part of God's family? What does the Bible say about that in John 13, which we might have here? So how do people know we're grafted into this family, that we're a member of God's family? Jesus says, by this they will know that you're my disciple, when you love one another. That's what Jesus said. That's how people know we're part of God's family. You know, families have reputations, don't they? You know any families that's got some reputations? <laughs> I come from the Sloan family, and, you know, we have some reputations. <laughs> Good and bad. It's one of those families you don't want to be on the, the bad side of them, you know what I'm saying? We've got that head of the holler kind of family reputation. And I'm proud of it. I'm proud of it. But families have reputation. God's family has a reputation. People should see us and see the love that we show and know that we're a part of God's family. And that's one of the problems is that we don't realize that we can mis misrepresent God's family. And some people judge. I mean, people that tell me they don't go to church. I, I have some friends that I kind of aggravate because they don't go to church. And they say, well, they're a bunch of hypocrites. And they're this, that, and the other. And I'm, I'm like, well, that's because you know, when you go to church, you're going to have all kinds of people. You're going to have people who are, who are really on fire for God. You're going to have people who act like they're on fire for God. You're going to have people who are not on fire for God. It's like a hospital. You know what I mean? There's some people might got a big hole in their head, and some people just there for a cold or whatever. It's the same thing. But got to know that we are representing God if we call ourselves Christians. We're representing his family. And our behavior should show that. We should know that we are representing God in this world as his family. And we should be known for our love because God is love. And this is the theme of the Bible. The theme of the scripture all throughout the Bible really is, has always been that God has a desire to be with us. Verse 23 of this scripture says, Emmanuel, it says, Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's what that name Emmanuel means. You know, sin has separated us from God, but God's desire has always been to be with us, to be with you, not just us as a group, each individual. I want to hit you with some more scripture because I like to do that to you. Galatians chapter 4, if you want to pull that up. And I could read my version here, and we'll see how close it is. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5 says, But when the fullness of time came, God sent out his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, which we saw just now, in order that he might redeem those under the law, in order that we might receive the adoption. Here it says the full rights of sons. But we receive the adoption. God wanted to adopt us. John 3.16 said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, or have eternal life. Some translations say God loved the world in this way that he gave his only begotten Son. Peter, I'm going to paraphrase this. First Peter, I think it's chapter 1, verse 18, says that... Uh, we were redeemed in his family, not with corruptible things like silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. 
John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12 says, As many as receives him, he gives the power to be sons of God. So you, you see a theme here. God wants to bring us into his family. He wanted to do something about the sin that prevented us from being in his family. And he did that. He, he allowed Jesus to come and die in our place so that we may be sons and daughters of God. That is what God's heart is towards you. Jesus' blood made a way for us to be in God's family. Don't you want that? I want that. And it's one of the greatest weapons that Satan has and he uses against us is to have us question, does God really love you? Has anybody ever heard that in their mind before? Or is it just me? Anybody else? Does God really love you? Some of us, we can't imagine that God would love us. You know, people who are prone to depression might have a hard time believing that God would love them. People who face terrible circumstances might question, God, do you love me? It's easy to buy into that idea. If God loves you, then how could this have happened? But your circumstances don't reflect God's love for you. That's hard for some people to believe. Not to say that you couldn't make any bad decisions or do something dumb and find yourself in a bad circumstance or whatever, but, and, you know, there are times that God allows us to get in bad circumstances because it's, the Bible says God chastises those that he loves. But not every situation is a sign that God doesn't love us. John the Baptist was imprisoned. They chopped his head off. And what did Jesus say about him? Because one would have said, well, maybe John did something wrong, or maybe... No, Jesus said he, there wasn't a man born a woman greater than John. So our circumstances don't always show us whether God loves us or not. Because one thing that the Bible promises, and we keep forgetting this, the Bible promises that in this world we will have tribulation. But Jesus says, behold, I have overcome the world. And, he, and Jesus shared in that tribulation with us. He went through a lot of things that he could have asked God, do you love me? when he was facing the cross. But sometimes we go through difficult things, but we know that no matter what, God loves us. God's love, and this is a hard thing. I learned this here in this church, actually. I used to have a stubborn belief about this. But God's love is un unconditional. I used to have a problem believing that. I thought, well, there's got to be some conditions, right? But the Bible says... That he loved us before, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That he didn't wait to see if we're, humanity was going to get its act together. He sent his son to die to offer us a pathway to God's family before he seen whether we'd be worthy of that. Even though he probably knew. And some of us turn him down, some of us don't. But that's the heart of God. So, and I'm closing, but there's one more thing I want to say. I believe that if it just was one person who needed salvation, Jesus Christ would have came and died for that one person. Amen. That's the love he has for us. Amen. And how do you know that, Jay? Because that's not in the Bible, really. But Jesus did say, it was talking about the good shepherd, he said he left the 99 to go find the one lost lamb. That's the heart of God. That's his heart towards you. Sometimes we think it's God's heart toward everybody, and it is. But we forget it's his heart towards you as an individual. He loves you. He wants you to be in his family. He de his desire is for us to be his children. And I thank everybody who's watching online, and I thank you all for being here, but I want, you to, I want to leave you with this one thought. It is God's pure motivation to you to bring you into his family? Just because he loves you. There's no love like that in the world. There's a motivation. We all have certain motivations of why we love and do things. God's love is so pure. It's the only reason he is doing all this stuff, because he loves you and wants you to bring you into his family. So I want you to remember that. This week, whenever the world challenges you and makes you feel like garbage or whatever is going on in your life, that God loves you and he wants you to be in his family. And all you got to do to be in his family is believe in his son and what he did on the cross and we honor him by getting baptized and doing all that. But that is all it takes. It's no magical thing. It's just belief in a God that loves you. Thank you for joining us online. I thank you for...
for joining us here. I want to close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love that you have for us. We thank you that you have shown your love, not only in words, but in deed. So much so that you came in the form of your Son and died on the cross for our sins. To take our place on the cross of Calvary. We thank you so much for all the love you've shown us each and every day of our lives. And that you're with us even during the valleys of our lives. Help us to open our hearts to you. And keep your word on our mind each and every day. In Jesus name I pray. Amen.